Hello and welcome back Discovery Learners to another episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. It is I, Teacher Liz here, your host once more on today, Thursday. On this episode, we're going to go over some observances, interesting history, I'll be showing you some cool landmarks, animals, pretty plants, and of course, some interesting facts. So let's not delay any further, let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance is National Tempura Day. On January 7th, National Tempura Day encourages us to celebrate a dish made with tempura batter. This Japanese fare is made up of either seafood or vegetables dipped in a batter and deep fried. Today, chefs all around the world include tempura dishes on their menus. They use a wide variety of different batters and ingredients, including non-traditional broccoli, zucchini, and asparagus. Chefs also dip dry fruits into tempura batter too. Some American restaurants serve chicken, cheeses, and particularly mozzarella in a tempura style. For sushi lovers, a more recent variation of tempura, sushi provides a new way of enjoying the delicacy. Sushi chefs tempura fry entire pieces of delicate sushi and serve it on a beautiful platter. Mmm, I love sushi. So how do you observe National Tempura Day? What is your favorite way to enjoy tempura? Think about it. Mix up your best tempura recipes. When you do, let your friends and family be the first tasters. Mmm, tempura. Anything fried in tempura is so good. Especially if you're dipping it into something. Have you tried tempura fried food items? Did you like it? Let me know in the comment section below. Our next observance is National Bobblehead Day. Each year on January 7th, National Bobblehead Day recognizes a day of celebration for all the spring-connected head bobbling figurines. For 100 years, bobbleheads have been entertaining and fascinating fans and collectors. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes too. Bobbleheads commemorate iconic teams, movies, and cartoon characters. Individually, they represent some of our most exciting athletes or thrilling television movie characters. Early bobbleheads, known as bobbers or nodders, developed from Germany. They took root in the United States pop culture in the 1950s and 60s. Bobbleheads resurged in the late 1990s when professional sports teams began using them as promotional items. Today, both as toys and collectibles, bobbleheads continue to amuse and captivate us. The National Bobblehead Hall of Fame and Museum submitted National Bobblehead Day in December 2014. On November 18, 2014, the National Bobblehead Hall of Fame and Museum was announced. The museum opened in 2016 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the houses the largest collection of bobbleheads. The building houses a tribute to their best bobbleheads with the Hall of Fame and many exhibits related to history and the making of bobbleheads. So, how do we observe National Bobblehead Day? Well, do you have any bobbleheads? Do you have enough to make a collection? And if you do, what kind do you have? Go ahead and let us know in the comment section below. I'd love to know. And our last observance for today is actually one that takes place all month long. A delicious one nonetheless. It's National Menudo Month. Mmm, I love menudo. January is National Menudo Month. This iconic dish is a Mexican soup made with beef tripe and hominy. It is typically a favorite at Mexican family gatherings and special celebrations. It is also rumored to be a perfect cure for hangovers. Celebrate by sharing your menudo tradition with loved ones and creating new family memories. I'll let you in on a little secret. The secret to delicious menudo is quality ingredients cooking time, and the cook's special seasoning, or sazon, that makes it unique. Menudo can be time-consuming to prepare, and there are many regional variations. It is typically served with an array of condiments including onion, cilantro, oregano, lime, and either bread or tortillas. Menudo is a perfect dish for bringing the family together. January is a cold month, so eating menudo all month long makes a lot of sense. I love menudo. It's so good. I like eating it with bread. Dipping it into the 
I guess you would say broth. I love it with extra hominy. It's so good. You can even eat it with crackers. I usually buy the big giant can of menudo from the store. Uh, usually Mexican markets have the big cans. So I go to Superior. So do you like menudo? Have you tried it before? I think this month is a good month to try. <laughs> Let me know in the comment section below. On this day in history. Today, in 1610, Galileo Galilei discovers the first three moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, and Ganymede. The Galilean moons, or Galilean satellites, are the four largest moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. They were the first seen by Galileo Galilei in December 1609 to January 1610 and recognized by him as satellites of Jupiter in March 1610. They were the first objects found to orbit a planet other than the Earth. They are among the largest objects in the solar system, with the exception of the Sun and the eight planets. With red eye larger than any of the dwarf planets, Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system and is even bigger than the planet Mercury, though only around as half as massive. The three inner moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, are in a 4 to 1 orbital resonance with each other. While the Galilean moons are spherical, all Jupiter's much smaller remaining moons have irregular forms because of their weaker self-gravitation. The Galilean moons were observed in either 1609 or 1610 when Galileo made improvements to his telescope, which enabled him to observe celestial bodies more distinctly than ever. Galileo's observations showed the importance of the telescope as a tool for astronomers by proving that there were objects in space that cannot be seen by the naked eye. The discovery of celestial bodies orbiting something other than the Earth dealt a serious blow to the then-accepted idea or theory that everything orbited around the Earth. That means around that time, a lot of people in the sciences and even in religious parties believed that everything in the universe revolved around the Earth, including the Sun. We now know that's not true. The Earth is not the center of the universe, nor is it the center of our solar system. Today, in 1934, Flash Gordon, a comic strip by Alexander Raymond, debuts. Flash Gordon is a protagonist of a space opera adventure comic strip created and originally drawn by Alex Raymond. First published on January 7, 1934, the strip was inspired by and created to compete with the already established Buck Rogers adventure strip. The Flash Gordon comic strip has been translated into a wide variety of media, including motion pictures, television, and animated series. The latest version of a Flash Gordon television series appeared on Sci-Fi Channel in the United States in 2007 to 2008. The Buck Rogers comic strip had been commercially very successful, spawning novelizations and children's toys. The King's Feature Syndicate decided to create their own science fiction comic strip to compete with it. At first, King's Feature tried to purchase the rights to the John Carter of Mars stories by Edgar Rice Burroughs. However, the Syndicate was unable to reach an agreement with Burroughs. King's Features then turned to Alex Raymond, one of their staff artists, to create the story. The themes of an approaching planet threatening the Earth, an athletic hero, his girlfriend, and a scientist traveling with a new planet by rocket were adapted by Raymond for an initial storyline. Raymond's first samples were dismissed, not containing enough action sequences. Raymond worked the story and sent it back to the Syndicate, who accepted it. Raymond's first Flash Gordon story appeared in January 1934, alongside Jungle Jim. The Flash Gordon strip was well received by newspaper readers, becoming one of the most popular American comic strips of the 1930s. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure for today is Charles Adams. Born January 7, 1912 in Westfield, New Jersey. 
This American cartoonist is the creator of The Addams Family, a popular cartoon that spawned movies, musicals, and television shows. In 1961, he received an Edgar Award from the Mystery Writers of America. Before he was famous, he was known for being distantly related to the United States President, John Adams. He unfortunately passed away in September 29th of 1988 at the age of 76. He drew and created nearly 1,500 cartoons throughout his lengthy career. Happy birthday, Charles! Our next notable figure is Nicolas Cage. Born January 7, 1964 in Long Beach, California. This American actor won the Academy Award for Best Actor in 1995 for his role in Leaving Las Vegas. He also starred in such films as Gone in 60 Seconds, The Rock, National Treasure, and Knowing. Before he was famous, he sold popcorn at the Los Angeles Theater after dropping out of high school at the age of 17. He also briefly appears in a 1982 film, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, working at a burger shop, but he has no dialogue in the movie. He also provided his voice for Grug in the movie, The Croods. He turns 57 years old today. Happy birthday, Nicholas! Another notable figure for today is Jeremy Renner. Born September 7, 1971 in Modesto, California. This American actor has earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor for his role as Sergeant First Class William James in The Hurt Locker. He has also played prominent parts in such films as Born Legacy, Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, SWAT, and The Town. Before he was famous, in the early years of his acting career, he performed as a musician with bands of Sons of Ben. In recent times, he was casted to play Hawkeye in Marvel's adventure movies alongside Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, and Scarlett Johansson. He turns 50 years old today, wow! Happy birthday, Jeremy! And our last notable figure for today is Kenny Loggins. Born January 7, 1948 in Everett, Washington. This American singer and songwriter who was popular in the 1980s with such hit singles as Danger Zone and Footloose. He also performed with Jim Messina in the band Loggins and Messina. Before he was famous, he formed his band Second Helping after moving to Alhambra, California. He turns 73 years old today. Wow. Happy birthday, Kenny. Come along, Discovery Learners, and we will see the landmarks of the world. As we continue our journey of discovery throughout Taiwan, here are some landmarks you should see. Starting with Taipei 101. Towering above the city like a giant bamboo stalk it was designed to resemble, Taipei 101 is impossible to miss. At 508 meters tall, Taipei held the title of the world's tallest building for a number of years, until 2011. It also held the title of the world's tallest green building. Ticket sales are on the fifth floor of the Taipei 101 shopping mall. The pressure-controlled lift is quite a rush. It goes up at 1,010 meters per minute. It takes about 40 seconds to get from the ground level to the 89th floor observation deck. Observation decks are on the 88th to the 89th floors, with an outdoor deck on the 91st floor, which is open on some occasions when the weather permits. Wow, pretty interesting building. And it kind of, yeah, it kind of does look like a stalk of bamboo. Next up, let's see the incredible temples of Lotus Pond. More particularly, the Dragon and Tiger Padogas. The area known as Lotus Pond, sometimes referred to as Lotus Lake, is certainly an outstanding place to visit in Taiwan. The pond is located north end of the city and is one of the largest man-made bodies of water. Lotus Pond gets its name from the layers of lotus blossoms that cover the water, and it's one of Taiwan's most popular tourist destinations because it's home to one of the most frequently visited temples in Taiwan, the CG Temple. It also has the largest Confucius temple in Taiwan, and the shoreline is literally studded with many bizarre looking pedogas and temples, especially the dragon and tiger pedoga. 
The dragon and tiger pedogas are impossible to miss. These colorful temples were built in the 1960s and they act as an extension of the CG temple on the opposite side of the street. You have to make sure you enter through the dragon's mouth and exit the tiger's mouth for good luck. Once you're inside the dragon's belly, you can look at some paintings which depict scenes of heaven and hell. These paintings are meant to encourage the visitors to do good deeds. Whoa, those are some pretty interesting looking padogas. I wouldn't mind visiting that place if I ever go to Taiwan. Next up is the Yanlu Hoodoos. Here, you can witness a different kind of rock formation in a fishing town in Taiwan. Yulu, Geo Park is a place where naturally formed rocks show off their odd shapes. They may help them pass as otherworldly creations. Yulu Geo Park is located in the town of Wanli, which sits between the cities of Taipei and Keelung in New Taipei, Taiwan. The natural creation part of the Dai Lo Benacene Formation stretches approximately 1,700 meters into the ocean. Formed as geological forces push the Dantan Mountains out of the sea, the weird-looking rocks are called hoodoo stones, and they are described as tall, thin spires of rocks protruding from the bottom of an arid drainage basin or badland. These hoodoos grow and may reach heights up to 1.5 to 45 meters. There are around 180 hoodoo stones in different stages of erosion. The rock formation that gets the most attention is called the Queen's Head. The 4,000-year-old rock got its name from the resemblance of the profile of the English Queen Elizabeth. Most people don't see the resemblance, but I guess you have to make sure you're looking at the rock at a certain angle to see the queen-like figure. Whoa, these rocks do look kind of weird. They kind of look like mushrooms. The things that water does to rocks is kind of, in a way, artistic. <laughs> so how did these rocks turn the way they look now? That's because of water erosion. It took many years of water erosion to create these mushroom-like shapes, which is pretty cool. Now, Taiwan's a really old country with lots of sea, but we unfortunately do not have enough time to cover it all. But what we did see was pretty spectacular. Now, be sure to tune in tomorrow as we recap what we've learned so far about Taiwan on Ability to Learn. Here's the animal of the day. Today's animal is the sea urchin. That's right, that's an animal and not a plant. Sea urchins are an easily recognized type of marine animals. They belong to a group of animals called encinoderms. There are around 200 species of sea urchins that can be found in oceans throughout the world. Sea urchins usually live in warm waters, on rocky bottoms, or close to the coral reefs. Pollution of the ocean and overfishing are the major threats to their survival. Due to drastic reduction number of sea urchins in the wild, they're placed on the list of threatened species, but they can become endangered in the near future. Here are some interesting things you should know about sea urchins. The size of a sea urchin depends on the species. They usually have 1.2 to 3.9 inches in diameter. Sea urchins have a globe-like shape of the body that is covered with a large number of long spines. Bony plates form from shell that provides protection of their most inner soft parts. Body of the sea urchin has a radial symmetry. That means that each sea urchin can be divided into five equal parts. The color of the sea urchins depends on its species as well. Majority of the species are black, brown, purple, red, or green in color. Sea urchins have five rows of paired tube feet at the bottom side of the body. They end with suckers which facilitate adhesion to rocks. That means it helps them stick to rocks. They also help them hunt and move on the ocean floor. Sea urchins have claw-like structures on the surface of their body, scattered among the spines. They're known as pedicellarae, and their main purpose is protection against predators. Besides that, they are used for food collection and removal of objects attached to the body. Certain species of sea urchins, such as flower sea urchin, have spikes filled with venom. Sea urchins also have a special type of mouth called the Aristotle's lantern. The mouth is equipped with five sharp teeth and are able to drill a hole into a rock. Sea urchins are omnivores. They eat both plants and animals. Seaweed, algae, plankton, and decaying organic matter are usually the on the menu for sea urchins. Even though sea urchins have spines, they have a lot of predators. 
The main enemies of the sea urchins are otters, seabirds, fish, crabs, sunflower stars, and of course humans. Yeah, people eat these things. <laughs> Especially in Asia, in countries like Taiwan, China, and Japan. Mating season of the sea urchin takes place in the spring. Just like many other sea creatures, sea urchins reproduce by external fertilization. Fertilized eggs undergo a larval stage before becoming an adult sea urchin. During the larval stage, sea urchin swims with any other tiny animals as part of the zoo plankton. Most species of sea urchins live up to 30 years. Wow! Red sea urchins has the longest lifespan on Earth. They can survive up to 200 years in the wild. Wow, that's incredibly old. That's even older than a, than a tortoise. So what do you think of the sea urchin discovery learners? They're kind of prickly and pokey, huh? I wouldn't want to step on one or pick one up. To be honest with you, they kind of creep me out. <laughs> so what do you think? Let me know in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is the lotus flower. Lotus is a type of floating aquatic plant of the genus Nelumbo. It also known as the Indian lotus because it represents the national flower of India. Lotus originates from southern parts of Asia and Australia, but it can be found in aquatic cultures throughout the world today. Lotus lives in shallow and murky ponds and lakes that are exposed to direct sunlight. It cannot survive in colder climates. Lotus is a symbol of beauty, grace, purity, and serenity. Since the plant is numerous both in the wild and in the culture, it is not on any list of endangered plants. Here are some interesting facts you should know about the lotus. Lotus flowers can only reach 49 inches in height, but it spreads about 10 feet horizontally. The flower can reach 8 inches in diameter. Lotus is either pink or white in color. Petals are shaped like a dagger. They are arranged in several layers. Lotus flower protrudes several inches above the water. This flower is also known by its beautiful scent. The flower opens in the morning and closes at night. The lotus is also a symbol of the sun, rebirth, and creation in ancient Egypt because of its unusual behavior which marks the beginning and the end of the day. Lotus is used as rhizomes to attach itself to the ground. The rhizome is buried in the mud or on the sandy floor. Leaves of the lotus are shaped like paddles. They each have 20 inches in length. Some of the leaves are submerged, while others float on the surface of the water. The leaves are equipped with air pockets inside the tissues, which maintain buoyancy. Lotus produces seeds in circular pods located in the center of the flower. Seed can remain viable for a long time. One type of lotus seed managed to develop into a plant after 1300 years of dormancy. Dried pot of lotus flower is very decorative and often used in floral arrangements. Petals are also used in ornamental purposes. The flower, young leaves, and seeds and the root are edible and often used in Asian cuisine. Older and bigger leaves are used for wrapping of food. Lotus is rich in fibers and vitamins of the B group. It is also a rich source of iron and other important minerals. Dried stamens of the lotus flower are used in preparation of aromatic teas. The lotus flower and the water lily may look similar, but they belong to different types of genre. They differ in color of the flower and the type of seed pod. The lotus is worshipped and considered as a sacred flower in Buddhism. Depending on the number of petals, it symbolizes either cosmic harmony or spiritual illumination. Some Buddhists even turn lotus flowers into powder and then use it in different ceremonies. Hmm, pretty interesting. I think the lotus flower is very beautiful. You tend to see them in home ponds, you know, with koi fish. What do you think of the lotus flower? Let me know in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is folktale. It's a noun. It means a story originating in popular culture, typically passed down by word of mouth. Folktale. The next word of the day is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's video. That word is revolve. It's a verb. It means 
move in a circle on a central axis. To move in a circular orbit around. To treat as the most important point or element. Revolve. Let's take a look at the art of the day. Today's art is the Jade Cabbage. The Jadeite Cabbage, or the Jade Cabbage, is a piece of jadeite carved into a shape of Chinese cabbage head, with a locust and a candid camouflage in the leaves. It is a part of the collection of National Palace Museum in Taipei, Taiwan. Despite its popularity with museum goers and frequent misrepresentation as a national treasure, it in fact is only designated as a significant antiquity, having less rarity and value than required for categorization as a national treasure under the Cultural Heritage Preservation Act. The Jay Cabbage is a small sculpture measuring only 7.4 by 3 inches and it's about 2 inches thick. It is hardly larger than a human hand. The ruffled semi-translucent appearance of the leaves is due to the combination of various natural colors of the jade to create the color variations of real cabbage. The figure was carved from a single piece of half-white, half-green jadeite, which contained numerous imperfections such as cracks and discolored blotches. These flaws were incorporated into the sculpture and became the veins in the cabbage stalks and leaves. The sculptor of the jade cabbage is unknown. It was first displayed in the Forbidden City's Yangqi Palace, the residence of the Qing Empire's Guangzhou Emperor's Consort Jin, who probably received it as part of her dowry for her wedding to Zhang Zhu in 1889. Following the fall of the Qing Empire, the Chinese Revolution of 1911, the sculpture became part of the collection of the Palace Museum in the Forbidden City. The piece survived World War II and the Chinese Civil War and was eventually relocated to Taiwan's National Palace Museum. This is a very interesting sculpture, and it looks a little realistic. What do you think of the jade cabbage? Let me know in the comment section below. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that hail is not frozen raindrops? It's true. Hail is a type of precipitation or water in the atmosphere. Hail is formed when drops of water freeze together in cold upper regions of thunderstorm clouds. These chunks of ice are called hailstones. Most hailstones measure between 5 mm to 15 cm in diameter and can be round or jagged. Hailstones are not frozen raindrops. Again, they are not frozen raindrops. Frozen rain falls as water and freezes near the ground. Hail is actually solid all the way down. Hailstones are formed by layers of water attaching and freezing in a large cloud. A frozen droplet begins to fall from a cloud during a storm, but is pushed back up into the cloud by strong updraft of wind. When a hailstone is lifted, it hits liquid water droplets. Those droplets then freeze to the hailstone, adding another layer to it. The hailstone eventually falls to the earth when it becomes too heavy to remain in the cloud, or when the updraft stops or slows down. Hailstones can cause extreme damage to buildings, cars, and crops. Not surprisingly, people have tried to find ways to prevent hail. In the 18th century, Europeans began trying to prevent hail by firing cannons into clouds and ringing church bells. <laughs> but there is no clear evidence that any of these techniques are effective. In other words, you can't really stop the forces of nature. According to the National Severe Storms Laboratory, the largest hailstone ever recorded in the United States was found in Aurora, Nebraska on June 22, 2004. It measures 17.8 centimeters or 7 inches in diameter. It had a circumference of 47.6 centimeters or 18.7 inches. That's about the size of a soccer ball. That's how big the hailstone was. That is huge. So yeah, hail isn't frozen raindrops. Pretty interesting, huh? Yes, cue the credits. This means we have reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun! 
and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. So farewell Discovery Learners, Teacher Liz here is saying thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to attend the live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day Program's educational team. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day Program.